first thing I want to talk about is the most important part of pin turning, the mandrel. And what I have here is uh, the basic mandrel that a lot of people start out with. Now you'll notice this one does not have a Morse taper on the end. It is threaded and basically it screws right onto the headstock of my lathe. I don't use this particular mandrel anymore and I'm going to tell you why. Um, you see it has a knurl nut at the end. Let me go ahead and load this up with a pin, um, the kit that we actually started on in uh, the first video. And I'll put a couple of spacers on here and then I've got, this is the spalted pecan blank I was working on in video one. One more spacer and then I'll put this knurl nut on and we'll snug it down. And this is how you basically load your mandrel. Now the problem with this mandrel and the reason why I don't use it anymore is if you over tighten this knurl nut down here and that can actually tighten up while you're turning as well you'll bend the shaft. The other thing you have to watch out for is this particular mandrel must have a live center in the tailstock. And basically, if you have your tailstock, you crank it down too tight, you can also bend your shaft. Now, that's the problem I've had with this. And let me undo this real quick and I'll show you. I was using this particular mandrel and I used it for about a year and I noticed my pins started coming out. They weren't quite matching up uh, at the fittings. It's hard to see in the video, but this particular shaft is bent. Now it's real simple. You just unscrew the shaft, and for about seven bucks, you buy a new shaft, and you insert it, and you go again. Uh, once again, I will state this can be purchased in a Morse taper. I just, my first lathe didn't have Morse taper, so uh, I had to purchase thread it. Let me show you the solution to fix that problem. This is called the mandrel saver. Now this one I did buy in Morse taper. Basically, just like anything, it goes right into the headstock of your lathe. This one has a neat little feature here. The tailstock, and it, it's live, it spins, is called the saver. And you'll see it, it has a ring around it. It slides over the mandrel up to the blanks, and it presses against the bushings. So what happens is all of your pressure is on the bushings and the blank. There's no pressure on the mandrel rod. There's no chance of bending your mandrel rod. The other nice thing is you don't have to use as many spacers because you can adjust this up or down and you just bring your tailstock you know, right up, lock it down, tighten it, and you're good to go. This will cost you about $10 more than a standard mandrel, but I recommend it because I bent mine and if I want to get mine working again, I now have to spend 7 bucks to buy a new um, mandrel rod. When you purchase a pen kit, one of the things it will tell you in the documentation is that you need a set of bushings and it'll give you the, the number of the bushings that you need to turn the pin. And these bushings are handy because what they do is they fit on the seven millimeter shaft of your mandrel and they tell you how thick you need to turn the wood so that it will match up perfectly with the fittings of your pin. And some of them can get kind of crazy. The back half of the pin may be larger than the front half. Um, and that's this particular set is for a classic pin from Penn State and that happens to be the pin we're going to turn. So let's go ahead and take the pin kit that we prepared in the first video and let's go ahead and get it in the lathe and ready to turn. I always like to put a bushing or two on the end of my mandrel because I don't like to turn real close to the, to the, uh, to the mandrel tip. Now with this particular kit we have two different size bushings here. The larger one is the back so we're going to pop the back bushing on first. We're going to bring up our pin kit. You might remember this has got some glue on it. It looks kind of rough, but you see the perpendicular line on there that we were very careful to place on there when we made the kit initially? That lets us know that that's the center of our pin. So we're going to slide one end of the pin on. Then we're going to take our bushing, and since the back half is larger than the front half, we're going to match that up with the back half of the other bushing. And then we're going to slide the front half of the pin on. Notice the perpendicular line. Perfect. And the front bushing. Now, it's kind of tight right there, and I don't want to be right up on my mandrel saver. So I'm going to go ahead and drop a couple of bushings on the end. I'll put my mandrel saver on there. Actually, I'm going to drop that into the tailstock. I'm going to bring my tailstock up, lock my tailstock, and I'm going to tighten it down just a fraction. And now we're basically ready to turn the spalted pecan blank. I wanted to take a second to make a couple of quick comments. 
Um, when you buy your mandrel, saver mandrel, it's going to cost about 30 bucks. Just wanted everybody to know that. Um, a standard mandrel is about $17, $15, $17. So they're not really bad. Um, they are a must-have. You can't turn a pin without them. The mandrel saver, as well as the standard mandrel, will come with about five spacer bushings. They're just seven millimeter bushings and that's what I'm using at the front and the back to kind of space it out to make it much easier for my tool to work in and out of these areas without having to worry about uh, hitting the mandrel saver or the front of the mandrel. And the bushings, each time you buy a pen they'll tell you you need bushing set XYZ and they're about four or five bucks a set. They're made of uh, aluminum uh, or some type of metal. It may not be aluminum. I could be wrong there. Uh, but when you buy a set, they can be used over and over, and you can literally make thousands of pins. So it is an investment. When you buy a pin, you must have the proper drill bit, which can be about nine, ten bucks. Proper set of bushings, which will be about five, four or five bucks. So there's fifteen bucks there. And then of course your pin kit, which you've seen the prices of those. They can range from a buck and a half on up to hundreds of dollars. And that'll kind of let you know what your initial investment is for pin number one. Now that you've got your blank mounted up and, and ready to turn, let's talk a little bit about tools. The first tool you'll need is some, a tool to round over the blanks. Now, most people would use a roughing gouge. I don't own a roughing gouge right now, so I've been using my spindle gouge. And basically, um, I'll just basically bring it in, lay it against the, tail, or the uh, tool rest, which I don't have in right now because it makes it a little easier to see, and I'll true my blank up. Uh, maybe not the best method, but it works. But once I've got the blank chewed up, I have a smaller spindle gouge that I'll bring in, and I can use this for kind of shaping my pins a little bit and just kind of working the blanks down to size. I've seen a few people, I don't like to use this myself, but a few people will use a scraper to shape their pin up, and I've even seen people true a pin with a scraper. Um, I don't like a scraper to true a pin uh, blank because it tends to really make a lot of chips, and then there's a lot of cleanup later on uh, once you do get it trued up. My go-to tool lately for truing the blanks up as well as um, turning the blanks has been my skews. Now I have two different skews. I have a larger skew here and then I have a smaller skew that came with a pin turning kit. Um, I do like the smaller skew but I gotta say the bigger skew is better for me because it's got a better sweet spot. Uh, and by a sweet spot you don't want to turn down at the end or way up at the tip. You want to turn oh about a quarter of the way up from the bottom and you want to lay this on your tool rest at about a 45 degree angle to your pin blank and it will basically shave this wood off true this blank up in no time flat and it'll leave such a smooth cut along this uh, blank that you can sometimes skip your 150 sanding and go straight to the 220. Um, I really like the way the skew's been working and that's been my go-to tool as of late. I'd like to make one last comment about the tools. Use what you have in your collection. Don't go out and fall into the trap of buying a special tool. Start out with what you have and learn with what you're comfortable with. And as you get better with turning, uh, then you can go out and purchase a specialty tool, a skew or whatever you might need to enhance your turning. Now let's get to turning this blank. Um, and what I'm gonna do is, uh, just for the sake of the video, I'm going to use several of these tools that I showed you today uh, just to show you that any tool will pretty well work for turning. So I'm going to start the uh, turning out at about 1500 RPMs and I've inserted my tool rest. I've made sure that I have clearance so nothing's going to hit. You'll notice my blank um, has a lot of uh, glue and some paper where the glue oozed out and the paper stuck to it. We don't ever worry about that and we don't worry about the line that we put on the blank because all that's going to disappear as we turn the wood down. So let's go ahead and get started and uh, see what this looks like. turning here I'm using more of the tip to round when I get further in and I want to shape I'll actually use more of the side
as you're turning, if you want to see if your blank is round without having to turn your lathe off, simply lay your tool on top of it. You hear that bouncing noise? That blank's not round yet. Much smoother now, we're getting closer to round. Almost no vibration. There's one little flat spot left in that blank. Look at that, perfect. Let's switch over, and I told you some folks will use a scraper. Now, I've not done this before, so bear with me, and I hope I don't screw anything up too bad, but let's give the scraper a try. Turn this off for a second. The scraper really is aggressive, and I just don't like the way it feels. Um, I'm going to move away from it, and I'm going to go back to my skew, and I'm going to true this one up with the skew. Now, I want to show you something. I've got the, it's kind of hard to see in the video, but I've got the uh, tool rest down almost just a hair below center on the pin. When I'm using a skew, I want to come over the top, so I need to raise my tool rest up so that the tool rest is slightly above center. A little bit too far. It, it's kind of hard to explain exactly where to put it. Uh, you kind of just get a feel for it as you go. I strongly recommend just getting a scrap piece of wood and, and uh, experimenting with your skew. We're going to try that and see what, what happens. Now when I bring the skew in, it's got this nice angle on it. I'm coming in at a 45, so I'm trying to get a 45 degree angle here. And I'm laying the bevel on, I'm letting it ride, the bevel is right here on the back of the skew. I'm laying the bevel on top, and then I'm lifting the skew up to make contact with the wood. And you're getting a lot of noise when I do that because obviously the blank is not round and I'm beating against the, beating against the tool rest but you simply lay the skew on the piece of wood, lift up, keep it at a 45 and just ride down the bevel and ride the bevel, uh, ride down the tool rest, letting the bevel ride on the wood at about one quarter of the way up and you're gonna get a really nice smooth cut. drop that tool rest just a tiny bit. I still feel like I'm a little bit high. Let's see if this helps out. Any. Once again, you can see I'm still not quite round.
there's still a little bit of square in that blank. I got a couple of, on either end, there's a flat spot there and a flat spot there. But you can see just how smooth the uh, skew is taking that wood off. So let's uh, switch to the smaller skew now and give that a shot and see how that works. <laughs> What I've done here is I've made a classic mistake. I'm kind of fighting the back end of my lathe. I didn't get my tool at the proper angle and I let it ride up a little bit, which happens with a smaller skew. I got out of the sweet spot. I got into the toe of the skew and I started to take up way more wood than I need to. So I'm gonna go back this way and try to correct some of that. Classic problem with a small skew. I'm going to jump back to the larger skew just because it's a little easier to control, better sweet spot. I'm taking my time. It's taking me a little bit longer than it should. Um, after you get good, you can whip these off pretty quickly, but I don't want to lift too far up and gouge in and uh, take a big chunk out of this pecan. Starting to get down pretty close to the bushings. On the classic pin, the back half of the pin, the cap is larger, and it's pretty much, if you take a look at some of the pictures, it's pretty much a straight tube. So we're just gonna make a nice smooth tube uh, from one end to the other. I'm making very light passes, just barely putting any uh, pressure on the blank. I don't wanna take too much material off because I'm getting really close. Really getting close. This is looking good. Each time I make a pass, I'm checking down at the bushing to make sure that I'm uh, not, I don't want to overshoot. I just want to get close without going over. Pretty darn close. All right, I have a nice smooth surface there. It's not gonna take a lot of sanding at all. You can see why I like going to the skew. It knocks down the corners quickly and allows me to shape the blank without a whole lot of trouble. <clears throat> I'm gonna jump up here to the front half. Now the front half of the blank 
Um, you'll notice it's a little larger here than it is here. So we're going to have a tiny bit of a taper as we go forward. So I'm going to take, uh, take a few minutes and turn this part of the blank. Now I did promise to uh, show different tools being used. So I'm going to use my uh, roughing gouge a little bit on the front. And uh, if I have any trouble, I may jump back to the skew because, like I said, it's just such a simple tool. Uh, makes such a clean slicing cut. And because I'm going to this particular tool, I will need to drop the tool rest a little bit because the spindle gouge requires it to be just right at or slightly below center. And I'm kind of giving a little more pressure when I get down to the end. You can see how that's sort of kind of tapering a little bit. Uh, I want to make sure that I do taper my blank toward the front of the pin. As I use this um, spindle gouge, I told you I'm going to drop the tool rest at or below center. I'm going in, I'm using, I'm not using the tip. If I use the tip, I'm going to have grooves all down through here. I'm using the side. I'm riding the bevel. There's the bevel on the back. I'm laying that on there. I'm lifting up and I'm just running right down the side of the tool. a lot of noise I am a little far away from the pin I probably should move my tool rest in um, but I'm so close to being finished and I'm not a huge distance bad habit you should keep the tool rest close but I'm gonna go ahead and finish the pin without it Okay, I've got a nice fit at both the front and the back of the bushings. It feels really good. And you really can't see it in the, in the video that well, but there are a few slight little grooves in here from the spindle gouge. That's the way I used to turn all of my pins is with that uh, small spindle gouge. Uh, but like I said, I've gone to the SKU and uh, I highly recommend learning your SKU because it will make a huge difference uh, in your pin. That pretty well brings me to the end of this section of the video. Um, I'm going to do one more section, section three, which is going to be finishing the pin. And basically, I'm going to go over sanding and uh, several of the different types of finishes that uh, I have used in the past, make some recommendations on the ones I like. Um, by all means, there are as many different ways to turn pins or finish pins as there are to turn pins. So uh, you're just going to have to kind of take what I say and... Uh, and, and try a few things, experiment, and see what works the best for you. So thanks for watching, and uh, stay tuned for video three.